The first rule of using a heavy-duty masonry saw is to always practice proper safety. Needless to say, I don't think this is what they had in mind. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today is a special day. Why? Because we're covering our first Jess Franco film, the gory Euro slasher Bloody Moon. Released in 1981, Bloody Moon is a nonsensical yet totally entertaining piece of Euro trash cinema. Filled with boobs, blood, and dead bodies, this one has a little something for everyone. And oddly enough, it's basically the only time Franco ever made a slasher flick. Titled The Saw of Death in German, this one boasts some unforgettable kills. But will this moon be bloody enough to earn five barf bags on the gore card? Let's get to the gore and find out. The film opens with a shadowy woman pushing a wheelchair. No credits, no title, Jess Franco's not screwing around. He's like, let's get this movie started, I gotta make six more of these this month. Look, that moon's not very bloody. I feel like I might have got a bait and switch here. Okay, we're 45 seconds in and I'm already totally lost. Yeah, this is definitely a Jess Franco movie. We then jump to this random chick. I like to think we're out here in the dark looking up at the same bloody moon and thinking of murder. It's so romantic. And it ends with a full G I zoom and a creepy line of dialogue. Miguel, I'm your sister. Don't look at me that way. From there, we head to this exciting dance. I sure hope they're not taking the person in the wheelchair here. That could be awkward. These two are off in the woods getting ready to do a different kind of dancing, but they don't realize this dude is looking to make it a threesome. Man, someone should get him some cosenics for that severe plaque psoriasis. More people then head off, including these two. I'd like to make love with you. So would I. Wait, she'd like to make love to herself too? She's clearly got a very high opinion of herself. Nobody will see us over here. Oh, but don't rush me. Yeah, no one will see us over here, 15 feet away from 40 people and right out in the open. While they're exchanging the most stilted and unerotic dialogue ever, Psoriasis guy is stealing the Mickey Mouse mask. Let yourself melt in my arms. Caress me gently. Everywhere. After putting it on, we get the Halloween killer cam perspective as he fixates on this one girl. How did Disney not sue over this? He's all like, hey, great moves, lady. Are you having a seizure or what? Also, is this a pool party, a 70s outdoor disco party, or a costume party? I feel like there's a lot going on here. And apparently it's taking place right next to the hedge maze at the Overlook Hotel in Kubrick's The Shining. They head back to her place and she realizes her mistake. Look, it's not contagious, I swear. She's not down, so he does what any rational gentleman would do. He stabs her with the scissors. With our first kill out of the way, we head over to this psychiatric clinic. Look, it's Dr. Jess Franco. He's here to give us his exposition diagnosis. We can't guarantee that your brother is totally cured, and therefore you must always keep your eyes open. If you guess her brother is Plaqueface, well, you can give yourself a screenwriter's credit. He kind of looks like the disco version of that kid from the Mask movie if you squint a bit. Also, he stabbed a girl with scissors and he only got five years at a mental hospital? Laws in Europe are pretty lax, I guess. Anyway, Miguel here is not out for ten minutes and he's already given this lady creepy looks. Clearly, Dr. Franco's treatment has been a resounding success. We then jump to the International Youth Club Boarding School of Language, a place apparently named by the All Your Base or Belong to Us guy. Look at that cheap sign. Our Garfunkel here runs the school, which is in financial trouble. Gee, who could have guessed? I mean, it has such a catchy name. Rolls right off the tongue. The bank refuses to extend our credit, and the old counters will get rid of us if we don't pay the money we owe for our rent. Hey, remember Wheelchair Lady? She's still in this movie. And then we hop over to Manuela and our Garfunkel, who clearly shop at the same super cool flappy shirt store. Keep it closed for business. Let one corner hang for party time. Also, I don't know, but looking at this place, I get the vibe that Granny here might run a drug cartel. I mean, she's obviously a charmer. What for? My niece isn't competent to discuss these matters. That's my business. You're always trying to butt in on everything, but just remember, I'm not dead yet. Meanwhile, our Garfunkel's like, I wonder if I should undo my shirt flap. Seems pretty obvious that Contessa Chapo here has been getting high on her own supply. She's got that classic coke-induced paranoia. Plotting against me all the time. I won't stand for it. Don't worry, Art's gonna settle things down though. Calm down, ma'am. Let me sing you a few verses of Bridge Over Troubled Water. 
Jump cut to another moon. This one also not bloody or in focus. That night, the Contessa's in bed, but someone wakes her up with this bright light. Oh. Oh. What are you doing? Turn that light off. It's blinding me. Turn it off. Do you hear? Wait a minute. Blinded by the light wasn't a Simon and Garfunkel song. <laughs> Although, neither was Light My Fire. The next day, class is in session. This is how we had to learn a foreign language in the days before Rosetta Stone. Nosotros estamos en el jardín. Um, is this scene going anywhere? At this rate, I'm going to be fluent in Spanish by the time it ends. You know, Hot for Teacher wasn't a Simon and Garfunkel song either. Now it's time for some tennis action. I sure hope Sick Flick's favorite tennis pro, Linda Day George, shows up. Bastard! Ah, oh, the magic of editing. These guys all suck. Don't wear Antonio out too much. Afterwards, we wind up at the pool. I never understand Spanish. Nothing seems to register upstairs. Yeah, clearly it's just Spanish. I'm sure you're a rocket scientist when it comes to everything else. If you're wondering what Miguel is up to, don't worry. He's still in this movie and creeping around like usual. I'll have nightmares if you go on telling all your horror stories. You've quite a repertoire of chilling tales. God damn, the dubbing in this movie truly is something. Anyway, the point of all this jibber-jabber is that the new girl is staying in the bungalow where Miguel killed the girl earlier and creepy stuff is happening. Like doors that refuse to stay closed. Yeah, just cut that wind sound effect. No, no, don't fade out. Just cut it. Ah, well, this seems like a great time for a gratuitous shower scene. Except, surprise, Miguel's like, hey, can I scrub your back for you? Dude really does look like Highlander's Connor McCloud with a bad case of eczema. And after all that, she doesn't call the cops, she just buys a flower from this random kid outside her door. Souvenir, souvenir, senorita. Then we get a third moonshot. Again, not bloody. I was promised a bloody moon, damn it. Manuela's out here pushing around the wheelchair. Has no one found the Contessa's burnt corpse yet? You'd think someone would go, man, it smells like burning carne asada in here, and then go investigate. At any rate, Angela from the bungalow isn't out of the woods yet, though. Literally or figuratively, as she walks right into this jump scare. Turns out she was really being followed by Art Garfunkel. You know, Every Breath You Take wasn't a Simon and Garfunkel song either. They end up in another bungalow where we're treated to this dialogue. What would you say if we decided to let you have a go Hello, here? Antonio. Hello, very well. And what about your lovely companion? <laughs> Look, there's no way this thing wasn't written by a barely intelligent AI. No human wrote these lines and said, ah yes, this is how people speak. And a fourth out of focus moonshot. No blood. Come on, Jess Franco. Miguel shows up while Manuela's getting ready for bed. She's clearly not allowed to stay up past the incest o'clock. Love me. Love me like you did before. We shouldn't, no matter how much we want. Well, now that that's over, let's head over to this random dance party. I feel like Jess Franco might be padding this movie's runtime. Angela and Antonio dip out, and you might say that romance is blossoming between them. Angela. Thanks. Out of focus moonshot, no blood. Everyone drink. Angela's doing a little reading before bed. Impossible to imagine that her murderer was stalking his victim. Lurking silently in the deep shadows of the night. What the hell? Now this movie has a narrator? The thought of her alone racing through his mind. This is like an R-rated version of Bastion at this point. After some cat and mouse, one of Angela's friends shows up to borrow a sweater. Excuse me, Angela. You wouldn't have a pullover to lend me. And she gets knifed right through the nipple for her troubles. And yeah, I can't show you that. She flees right into Antonio, who's pretty condescending for someone who's just been told there's a murderer nearby. First of all, let me look inside the bunk. Are you sure it's not your imagination? He takes her back inside where the body has vanished, and he can be more condescending. Ah, here's the guilty party. A murder story. The killer came at midnight. Next thing you know, another chick shows up, followed by our Garfunkel. What you wanted is obvious, isn't it? Now get out of Angela's room immediately. Will you beat it?
You know, Beat It was an assignment in Garfunkel's song either. And just because this movie wasn't exciting enough, it's time to ratchet things up another notch with more Spanish class. Thrill as these students learn to conjugate verbs in Espanol. You're as good as dead. I will murder you. Man, this class just got weird. After that, Angela does her best Nancy Drew impression as she investigates Ava's mysterious disappearance. Then we get a sixth moonshot. This time in broad daylight, but still definitely not bloody. As she continues to investigate, she takes a break to almost get stoned. Literally. <laughs> I Am A Rock was indeed a Simon and Garfunkel song. Undaunted by her hard rock experience, she continues to investigate. She meets Antonio, who's clearly waiting for a flood. Look at those pants. Anyway, Angela's about to get some snake action. And not from Antonio, but this real snake. He saves her by chopping its head off, for real. Shame on you, Jess Franco. She freaks and Antonio chases her down, but our Garfunkel shows up looking like he's ready for some day sailing. Sailing wasn't a Simon and Garfunkel song either. Angela's convinced Antonio is the killer. Antonio's murdered Ava and he's just tried to murder me as well. I'm gonna get the police. These chicks say what we're all thinking. She's nutty. She's out of her mind completely. She just flipped out. A murder <laughs> should be here. Over in another movie, Inga here is faking having sex. There's no point to this except to show us where Ava's corpse wound up. She's just hanging around in the closet. After that, Inga's off with a real man. But she's a little tied up. It's okay though because the little kid is peeping. Talk about random. And now we come to Bloody Moon's most infamous scene. With Inga all secure, our killer starts the masonry saw. She inches closer and I think we all saw what was coming next. Say what you want about Inga, but she definitely lost her head over this dude. Man, look at that mannequin head. Satisfied that the saw is in good working order, our killer heads home. But before he can do that, he's gonna run down this kid. <laughs> Twenty-five points. Back at Casa de Crazy, Manuela's still pushing the Contessa around. Angela's like, it's time to get the hell out of Dodge, but Antonio's at one door and Miguel is at the other. She's basically the meat in a potential psychopath sandwich. Angela, I have to speak to you. <laughs> Angela! Also, Stuck in the Middle with You was not a Simon and Garfunkel song. She's basically self-quarantining inside her house, but this cat doesn't care about your social distancing rules. Eventually, she backs right into this jump scare, and Norman Bates is the shit out of this guy. But it turns out it was a mannequin. Gee, didn't see that coming. Then Laura clues her into what she's really done. You read too many murder stories. You're unbelievable. What you saw was not a murderer, but just a dummy. Unbelievable was also not a Simon and Garfunkel song. Angela's had enough and calls the request line, but she can't get through. Laura heads out on a booze run, but she's being stalked. She's almost back to safety, but the killer gets her with these crazy tongs. <laughs> Back inside, Angela gets a call from the killer, but he doesn't sound like Miguel. Hello? Prepare yourself to die. I'm going to kill you. Could Jess Franco be about to give us the swerve? The killer is now somehow inside the tiny bungalow and has had time to stage the victims in typical slasher film fashion. Inga's in the bed, and Angela's like, wake up, sleepyhead. Then she finds Ava and Laura, who's basically just hanging around. She flees and the killer grabs her, but she's about to be rescued by... Miguel? Yeah, told you the swerve was coming. Miguel gets bean, but that's enough opportunity for Angela to flee. Gee, thanks lady. But then she runs into another killer, the crazy mental handyman. <laughs> And then she runs right into our Garfunkel. I knew Paul Simon was the only sane one in that group. Rather than do anything, Art just drives off. Sure, that totally makes sense. Meanwhile, Miguel is awake again. 
Oh man, this cut on my head is totally gonna leave a scar and ruin the way my face looks. Angela takes off under the cover of Purple Filter mid-afternoon and finds Manuela. Help me, please! You've got to come and help me, please! What's the matter? Why aren't you supposed to stay? Manuela takes her inside and slips her the roofie. But before she passes out, she explains she's seen the murderer. I've seen those eyes before. They're cold and blue. As cold as ice. Cold as Ice was not a Simon and Garfunkel song either. If you guessed Garfunkel and Manuela were in on it, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. They're setting Miguel up to take the fall for these murders. So therefore, his loving sister Manuela inherits her aunt's fortune. <laughs> Too bad Miguel walks in and here's the plan. Bitch in the wheelchair, that pathetic deformed brother of mine. Always gaping at me as if he thought I loved him. They continue doling out the plot, and Manuela's changing the deal. You've already been paid, haven't you? You slept with me, isn't that payment enough for you? Man, someone sure has a high opinion of herself. Just an observation, but you should have probably gotten him to kill Angela before dumping him. Of course, maybe Miguel will just do it instead. He's totally choking her out, convinced she's his sister, because apparently he's now blind. Angela stabs him in the throat. You always were a real pain in the neck, Miguel. After that, she takes off and finds the Contessa. And in the least surprising reveal ever, we learn the Contessa is indeed well done. Art Garfunkel grabs Angela and starts doing his best Mac the Knife impression. Also not a Simon and Garfunkel song. Except before he can finish the chorus, Manuela shows up with the hedge clippers. I'll show you how to trim a bush. Manuela could finish off Angela, but instead lets her live. That might be a mistake. Miguel and Alvaro are both murderers. Remember that. And just be damn sure to remember it. Now get out. She heads back upstairs to browbeat Miguel's dead corpse, but surprise, he's somehow still alive. Hey, remember Antonio? He's still in this movie too, and he's brought the police. No, not Sting and company, the real cops. Not that it matters, because upstairs, Miguel finishes off Manuela and dies on top of her. Ah, true love. Man, not one bloody moon in that entire movie. I feel kind of ripped off. Despite that, and the hilariously bad dubbed dialogue, and the script that feels like it was cobbled together from scenes cut from other movies, I actually quite like Burning Moon. Franco made a lot of films before his passing in 2013, and this one is one of my favorites. It's got a little something for everyone. Disfigured mass killer, callbacks to better movies, creepy incest, and some solid kills. But will that be enough to earn out the coveted five barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card. In terms of gross anatomy, Bloody Moon offers up a smorgasbord of splatter. We've got extreme scissoring, one knife through a nipple, death by tongs, one throat stabbing, the Spanish hedge trimmer massacre, and that brutal masonry saw decapitation. While some of the effects look a little dodgy, it's still good enough to earn Bloody Moon four barf bags out of five. This one's definitely a sick flick. Looking for more Euro gore from 1981? Then be sure to check out my review of Joe D'Amato's Absurd. You'll find a link to it here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.